Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Chris Hurley. I'm the Vice Clinical Social Worker here for the uh, Neurology Group at the Neurological Science Resource Center. And my name is Tammy Evano. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, I work with the Memory and Movement Disorder Clinics at Norton Neuroscience Institute. Yeah, so we, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to you today to do this live event to kind of talk about uh, triggers, you know, preventing triggers, especially for behavioral circumstances, especially when we have uh, a time and age when everyone's consuming a lot of media, like they're on now, <laughs> uh, you know, TV, social media, uh, you know, whatever, however you consume your media. Unfortunately, a lot of it sometimes can be overwhelming, can be negative, can trigger uh, stress, anxiety, whatever it may be, uh, even things as, as depression. So we kind of want to talk about what you can do, uh, how you can manage it. So are we, we I want to make sure that we can ask questions. And so you all feel free to, to ask questions. I assume you can write it uh, uh, in the platform there and we'll be able to see those questions, respond to you. Uh, so so with that, I'll, uh, Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> Let's start a little bit by talking about dementia and cognitive impairment. So we kind of have a frame of reference from uh, what we're talking about. So any type of cognitive impairment is kind of how you plan and organize and sequence. Um, those things are kind of higher cognitive type functions. And then there's also memory loss. And as that progresses, people have a little bit more difficulty managing things like sensory input and differentiating. Um, like what's real versus what's not real. And unfortunately, um, in this day and age, we kind of have the media running 24 hours a day in yeah. the background on the telephone or um, on television. And sometimes that can be difficult for people that have cognitive impairment in general to be able to differentiate from. Particularly, we know that a lot of caregivers that are taking care of family members at home have more difficulty in the evening. The evening and nighttime seems to be a more stressful period for family members that are caring for people in the home. And that's a lot of times when the evening news is on. So listening to those things, hearing those things in the background can sometimes be difficult for people that have cognitive impairment, dementia, memory loss, because they can't always differentiate whether those things are actually happening right now, the space that they're happening in, can some of those things be happening in their home? Um, they're often fearful of somebody breaking in the home. They can see things outside that they misinterpret as an intruder. Um, so there are a lot of things to consider when you think about the background noise that people pick up on that they don't realize the conversations that they have and the things that are going on in the background can be perceived by their family member as actually happening now. So what are some good strategies that we can think of to kind of minimize some of those things? Um, what would you say? One, one is gonna be limitation, moderation. Like those are the things that we wanna make sure. We wanna be aware of kind of what's on in the background. We wanna be aware of how much uh, we're utilizing this or we're hearing this. Um, so trying to replace uh, at least a little bit of that time or during those heightened times when we're looking at news or media, or we know that our, our loved one uh, is, uh, is toward the end of the day or you, know, you have trouble spots throughout the day, uh, you can replace these one by either limiting or, or, or putting away the media, not having the TV on, not having access to Facebook or whatever it is, because there are gonna be different levels of engagement for the media uh, in replacing that with something else, something that's more calming, uh, something that can, can be more of a benefit, uh, a benefit to not only the, the patient, but you as a caregiver. You have to remember that it's a trickle down effect. So if, if the individual is becoming uh, you know, more stressed out, has a, um, has a better chance of responding negatively to something, that's going to trickle down to the people that, that care for that individual as well. So if you're going to have some type of behavioral disturbance, or you're going to have some type of uh, emotional disturbance, that's probably going to manifest into 
some form of management for the caregiver. And if we take it one step farther, that's going to increase the stress and the anxiety level of the caregiver as well. So we wanna make sure that we limit, uh, not only for the patient, but for the caregiver as well, uh, what we're watching, uh, how we watch it, uh, and replacing those with things that, that may be a little more comfort driven. Yeah, so if we think about some of the things that are most common um, for the families that we provide care for, probably some of the things that are most commonly reported to us are restlessness in the evening, sometimes difficulty sleeping, um, repetitive questions, fretfulness, frequently in the evening or more toward nighttime. Um, a lot of times uh, people experiencing cognitive changes will become more fearful at night, more distrustful of people. They may sometimes think that there are intruders trying to come into the house or see things or hear things that are distressing to them. And if there are things playing in the background, and if you even think about like television shows that we watch, I'm not gonna name anyone in particular, but even um, a lot of television shows have things that are distressing, detective stories, um, 911 stories, all types of stories that can be distressing. Um, and sometimes that can be incorporated into the thought process that the person is experiencing. Maybe not prominent, but maybe somewhere in the background, it can influence how well they sleep at night. It can sometimes change their perception of how they view the people that are in the home and what their experiences are and what kinds of things might've happened. And they begin to kind of incorporate that into their reality at the time. And it can, in uh, some instances, create kind of a delusional system where the end result is it's rooted in fact, but it has kind of transitioned into something that they have incorporated into their reality and becomes distressing or frightening. And for family members, that can often be difficult to figure out how to redirect or manage or be supportive of those people when they have a difficult time understanding where that comes from. So part of our role here is to try to be supportive of families, help them understand how um, what we would describe as neuropsychiatric symptoms related to cognitive change can impact how uh, their loved one manages and functions throughout the day and what can they do to make them feel safer, more comfortable and create a safe environment within the home. I know one of the things that we always emphasize and Chris is really great at um, helping us with this is gun safety mm -hmm. and making sure that anybody that has any type of cognitive impairment does not have an unsecured weapon in the home. Um, that if there is a commitment to keeping a firearm in the home, that it's secured and taken care of properly. And that's something great that Chris is really good at. He gets in there and talks with the fellows about that. Um, but there are a lot of things uh, that we can do to help family members. Yeah, especially when you, when, you know, Tammy's kind of, kind of acknowledge this, but a lot of what we watch media, unfortunately, is a good portion of it at least can be related to guns and violence or violent nature. Uh, so when you're kind of playing with that 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 cognitive distortion and, and, and kind of adding these, these violent depictions that we see in social media, on TV, on the news, whatever it may be, that, that is a you do have a high threat for that. Um, that's that's a great point. Uh, that, that is something that we do have to, to kind of monitor and, and, and assess, yeah, not just at one point, but uh, as an ongoing uh, as an ongoing thing. Uh, you know, as, as far as kind of, you know, we, we, we've talked about kind of monitoring and limiting that, that, um, that media consumption, you know, some things that you can replace it with, or you can help to even intervene during uh, kind of a stressful time or uh, to help uh, you manage behavioral, um, uh, kind of behavioral, I guess, fits or, you know, difficult times that you may have with your loved one. Uh, I've, I've noticed that that a reminiscence or memory uh, type uh, activities 
can really assist an individual. So using photo albums, using things that, that patients familiar with, that they find comforting, that they, they, uh, that they, they can actually try to bring back and remember and kind of implement. So like I said, photo albums, pictures, home videos, things that they've made, uh, things that they've been given that they, they hold value to. These are things that can help you not only uh, kind of intervene during a, during a more difficult time, uh, but, but to kind of implement to, uh, to, to maintain behavior. Yeah, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that we can assist families with in terms of being able to manage care for people at home. Some of those things, um, hopefully the majority of them will be related to education and helping people learn non-pharmacological interventions that they can put in place. Sometimes just understanding what that person is experiencing and how they can best help them to navigate through that difficult time. Um, is the thing that's the most helpful. There are instances where pharmacological intervention is appropriate. And if that's the case, then that certainly is something that we can help to manage. But the majority of what we wanna try to emphasize is family teaching and learning and trying to help people understand where that comes from. It's extremely difficult. And I had a mother that I cared for with dementia and I do this for a living and I wasn't as able to recognize some of her cognitive impairment because it's really difficult when it's your family member to be able to be objective and to recognize some of the changes that go along with cognitive impairment and memory loss because there is so much that we already know the background to and we have social interaction with them and you may not always check in with just how are you managing your checkbook? Um, you know, you don't always ask what the year is and the date is and do they remember certain things? Um, you just are with them as family and you share family and social experiences. And so sometimes those things kind of fly under the radar, so to speak, and we miss those things. And unfortunately, those memory losses can sometimes become more noticeable when people begin to experience a little bit more of these changes that we would call neuropsychiatric changes, like more confusion or restlessness in the evening, difficulty sleeping or asking the same question, being more repetitive, um, safety issues like burning something on the stove or forgetting things. Um, misplacing your keys or, uh, you know, I do that daily, seriously, I daily, I misplace my keys. <laughs> um, but the problem becomes blaming other people, then that kind of takes it to another level. If you begin to become paranoid and lose lots of items and then begin to become paranoid about those people around you. So as you can see, as cognition changes, there are a lot of things that families begin to experience and all the things that come in from outside, whether it be the news or talking about any kind of incidents that are stressful at work or all kinds of things have an impact upon how they feel and how they experience the world. Okay. I'm, we're here to, to support and help you figure those things out. Even if even if there are issues or concerns and difficulties as, as, as those become, they're going to occur. But we're here to support each patient and family individually and, and, and add that guidance. Um, so, you know, again, as, as Tammy said, to educate and, and guide along, we can, we can do that as well. So how can you find us? If you feel like your family member um, has any of these kinds of symptoms that we're describing, or you're worried about that, or you feel like that we might be able to help with something, how can you find our memory clinic? Um, you can call the number, which is 502-394-6460, and that will put you in touch with the Norton Neuroscience Institute and they can direct you to one of our providers that can get you set up for an appointment with the memory clinic. Um, and Chris and I are also there to supplement 
Mm -hmm. um, we have geriatric medicine, we have behavioral neurology, um, psychiatry, crisis, social work. Um, and we're there uh, to work together as a multidisciplinary team, very unique, and um, be able to help your family with some diagnostics and clarify diagnosis for you and see if there's anything that we can do to address any of those symptoms that you're experiencing within your family. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all so much for Appreciate joining it. us today. Thank you.